right, Micah, welcome to episode one of Arts and Focus. Thanks for having me. You are our first guest. Um, this is a hybrid show. It's a podcast, uh, one part with an artist like yourself. And then we also have Huntington University students going out and doing field exercises out in the community, profiling arts organizations, things like Second Saturday. Yeah. Um, so we'll be cutting to those in the middle of the show at some point. So um, yeah, you are our inaugural guest helping us launch this. So thank you for coming. And um, I do have to say this is the second time we've done this because the first time we did this, we did not hit the record button, but what? we are making sure. Are you serious? <laughs> we, we're making sure we are triple, quadruple checking that we've hit the record button and we're grateful for your heart and willingness to come back and do yeah. this again. No, so. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Um, art in, arts in Focus is uh, kind of entering into that conversation of arts and faith, um, artistic enterprise vocation, your calling, but also your, your, uh, your faith piece and how kind of those two things intersect. So I guess we'll start with just a basic, like, how did you first discover you loved music? Mm. I um, I think I got to give most of the credit to just the environment I grew up in. Um, my dad and was very musical. He was a music major. He was a, a worship pastor as well. Um, my sister is a vocal major from ASU. We, we all just grew up around music. Music was really important in our family. And uh, yeah, at an early age, was very curious about it and very quickly found that that was the medium in which I um, I most related to um, expressing myself, you know. So that that just quickly took, I'd say, probably around the age of eleven or twelve, and um, never stopped from there. Just was it like an assembly or something, or like what was the big moment for you where you were like, I think this is it. I think I want to do this. I started a little like terrible punk rock band um, with my friends and in their our garages. And we played our first show, and I was like, this is it. And, and, and then um, from there, yeah, been always writing music mm -hmm. um, and simultaneously um, just enjoyed providing and performing music in spaces, and whether that's, um, you know, uh, faith gatherings of different kinds, you know, um, or whether that's concerts or... Um, yeah, everything in between. Can you talk about that tension between <clears throat> earnestness and and sincerity and and being a performer mm. and the difference between like Bono at the Super Bowl <laughs> and in a coffee shop, just sort of three chords in the truth, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think. I mean, I don't. I I can't really relate to the Bono experience totally. I mean, I did. I have played some big shows and, and toured and stuff. I I, I think um, I would just say that hopefully even Bono finds this space of intimacy. Um, so I think an artist can get to a place where it feels pure um, and you can both per be performing um, and bringing your best and um, yet you can be in a internal space of intimacy and just, I guess it kind of comes down for me like to what I'm doing it for. Um, am I doing it for some sort of recognition or for affirmation from from people, which sometimes is the case? Yeah, when somebody pulls you aside and um, says like that was amazing, like yeah, how do you? It feels good. It feels good. How do you make that not the reason you're doing it? Like for that? Yeah, I mean, I'm. I think every artist to degree is a recovering addict of attention and well being seen and right? yeah uh wanting people to wanting their value to be um in what they're able to do and how people receive them and um that you know it for me it was more important of not ignoring that reality just saying yeah that exists but also how do i become the healthy healthiest version of that and how do i let that um how do I just diminish that value for myself and make the the value of knowing that I just the the beauty of just creating the beauty of expressing expressing yourself and putting something 
um, beautiful out there um, can be enough, you know. So releasing outcomes is has really? been a big part of the journey. Like, um, you know, um, I'm more of the type of creative that of that's on the sp- spontaneity side of things. So when I create, I'm not as much of the perfectionist, but more of the let's see what happens. Um, so that, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers yeah, your no, question. Releasing but. outcomes. I also, Peter Jackson said the most honest form of filmmaking is to make a film for yourself. Mm-hmm. I think Rick Rubin said something very similar, yeah. just about not worrying too much about audiences and what audiences want, but what's true right now, right here. Yeah. What do I want to say? Right. And what's going on with me kind of, can you talk about when you're writing kind of that process of, uh, you know, kind of what's resonating in this time, in this space, Mm -hmm. you know, things are changing all around us, right? It's chaotic. And then how are you processing? Yeah, there's a, I think there's a spectrum to the creative process. There's a more commercial side that I, I, um, I think is totally valid as well, where I, if I'm getting um, paid to create something for a specific audience, that's, uh, uh, that's just a different kind of creativity that I have to tap into. Whereas if I'm um, reaching deep within myself to express something that I'm trying to name something that that's within me, um, that's just the other side of the spectrum. I feel like of in creativity and in songwriting and creating whatever art you, you, you want to create, um, there's kind of that spectrum that I think all of it belongs, um, and I think some of us maybe feel gifted in one end of the spectrum more than the other, but I think some of the journey is, is like diversifying how you can create and, and the environments you can create, create in and for. Um, so like if I'm writing a song that I really feel like is, is important for, a, for my church community, like a corporate worship song is going to be a lot. I'll, I'll have a different approach to how I write that song than if I'm writing a song, one of my own original songs for my solo project or for my, um, yeah, experimental rock band or something like that. I think there's just there's just a difference in 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 that for me. There's a um, I think a dynamic in relationship that I've heard of creatives talk about doing what scares them, do the thing that scares you, do it afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, is there an aspect of that in your songwriting or or even trying to reach and hit certain notes or whatever where it's like there's a vulnerability to it that you have to press into and overcome and push past mm-hmm. and be like, this isn't going to resonate with everybody. Not everybody's going to like this or mm-hmm. I don't, you know, like overcoming that and interjecting and being like, um, I, I'm i scared to share this part of myself or, mm-hmm. or, or story with others, but I'm going to go for it. What is that like for you? Yeah, it's a it's a cycle. Um, it's like a cyclical journey of um, getting through the fear, like of putting something out there and caring about how it's received. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's the creative process is a very cyclical journey. Uh, like I'll um, I'll feel those those nudges to push myself or to do something different or to uh, be more vulnerable. And then I'll have to go through that, that journey and time of prayer and all those Mm -hmm. things of, of wrestling with that. And is this, is this uh, coming from a good place? Is this, is this the right thing to do? And usually it is. And usually it's, if, if, if I'm like you, like you kind of said, if it's a little bit scary, that probably means it's, it's where you need to go. I've heard so many creatives yeah. that I respect say that's the indicator. If, mm-hmm. if you're if you're a little bit in over your head, like that's yeah. the direction. Yeah, like with this last record I released, it was like my first time. Um, I usually I go to a, like a studio and work with a producer and all that, and this was the first time self producing and recording the entire thing, and that felt like really scary and and like I don't know, just it felt like a little bit in over my head, um, and yet. It, you know, looking back on it now, I'm like so glad I did it that way. Mm-hmm. So it, that's usually the case. Is is um, that's an indicator for for that you're onto something? Is if maybe you're a little uncomfortable with the. Do idea. you have voices in your life that are telling you 
yeah, I think you should do this. Yeah, you should yeah. go for that. Yeah, that's that's really important to have um, friendships and um, you know just relationships that that prep push you and press you and um, that you can bounce ideas off of. That's essential, I feel like, for a creative. Um, I don't know. Uh, they were talking about Van Gogh and Van Gogh's brother, and Van Gogh's brother recognized Van Gogh's genius and mm-hmm. like. We would not have Van Gogh without Van Gogh's brother, that cheerleader, that somebody that is sent by God to recognize artistic genius and to push them and be their encourager. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, let's not just uplift the artist, but also the encourager in the artist's life who is affirming what they see yeah. and what is like, here's what I think others need to see. Oh, it's so needed. And even for artists to do that for one another is probably maybe even more powerful. Mm. Okay, well, that segues us beautifully to um, Second Saturday and community and mm-hmm. art and community. And can you talk about, one, this is a big one, but, like, why the arts matter. <laughs> Number two <laughs> is uh, w- w- why, why, what, what are you seeing arts bring to specifically, like, the West Valley and mm-hmm. Peoria? Um, I think I've recognized just um, no matter where I go, I feel a desire to nurture um, the arts in community. I think the arts is a form of hospitality, um, and art, the arts itself nurtures community and brings people together in experience, and um, it, it, it shares something, you know. And so, um, you know, right out the gates of um, being down in Old Town Peoria, um, we were just, we knew, we had this, we had a vision of, of bringing the arts into that area, but didn't know how that was going to happen, but just started um, organically um, doing, creating events and creating art. And um, very quickly, we made relationships with the city of Peoria and uh, Mary Lou Stevens, and she, they just recognized our heart for nurturing the arts in, in that area and um they just uh became a great um partnership with us in saying hey we want to help you guys we want to pour water on this Mm. so that turned into just us um creating a a regular rhythm called second saturdays of of, it's a big celebration of of local professional artists um musicians visual artists painters photographers um, and then we have a we have like a, a market as well, artisan market, um, food trucks, all that stuff. So it's it's a combo of just a community event, but focused on um, on the arts specifically. So we're able to uh, bring um, prominent artists and bands and songwriters from all over the city and state that are are doing amazing things and bring them to downtown Peoria. And, showcase them and so yeah that's 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 what it is right now yeah um i think you touched on something really important and that it's important for um artists to be of service to other artists and give platform if it's possible so that's one of the things and missions of this class actually that i'm teaching is um, sending students out to the community to highlight artists and arts organizations that are are making the world in their little corner of the of the world uh, a little better with with their art and second saturday gets featured and some others so we'll take a look at those uh right now cool i was born in phoenix and just lived in this area my whole life i went to camelback high school here i am still here the next spring is the 25th anniversary of the phoenix film festival the festival started in 2001 from there, I expanded out and got more and more responsibility. This will be our 22nd year up here at the Scottsdale 101. We have a fancy mission to engage filmmakers and film audiences to see diverse and new works. And ideally, we're trying to help grow the next generation of filmmakers. We're easily the largest film festival in the Phoenix area. That all happens in one place. Where we are now becomes our box office and ticket center. When I was in high school, I did a ton of theater. Having that arts and learning about teamwork, responsibility, and all those things that come along with any art. There's somebody's in charge, you gotta have leadership, and just interacting with people is a big deal, and the same thing for not only film, but in theater. When you watch great film, you laugh or cry, 
you're drawn in. It's good for your heart. There's nothing like it. Ideally, the theater is the best place because there's no interruptions. This is me and this movie and this story so I can shut out the rest of the world. When you come to a festival, give yourself a chance to think outside what you would normally do. Do a little bit of everything. Step outside your comfort zone and you might find something new that you love. We have our tagline is find your new favorite movie. And that's what happens. People come and they're like, oh my God, I love this movie. It's so amazing. It changed my life. And they're hooked. My name is Paul Peterson. I'm the director of patron development for TheaterWorks. Right now we are in rehearsals for Disney's Beauty and the Beast. I take care of a lot of things. I oversee the marketing, I oversee the sales, and the patron experience. But aside from that, I'm also the choreographer for Beauty and the Beast. Usually I find out that I'm going to be a choreographer on a show months in advance. And once we have a cast, we have about six weeks to rehearse the show, from first rehearsal to opening night. A choreographer, we start from a blank slate. And so my process is first to read through the script, listen to the music, and I come up with movement that tells the story for each of those musical sections. The most challenging thing to choreograph for Beauty and the Beast was Be Our Guest. There are so many different people in that and they all have different roles. And so as a choreographer determining if a cheese grater could dance, what would they dance like? What I do sometimes with a show is I look to see if there's any iconic choreography that the public is expecting to see when they come to that show. Lumiere has some iconic moves and poses that he does that we really try to incorporate into our show. So when people see that, it's a nice throwback to when they saw the cartoon or when they saw the stage production somewhere else. My favorite moments to choreograph were the moments with the wolves. It's been great working with them to kind of create them attacking Maurice and also attacking Belle and the Beast are, is all done through dance. My favorite part of the process is opening night. There is just something so electric about opening night. Great to finally get an audience in there to have real life reactions and to hear their reactions while the show's going on. My name is Micah Bentley. I um, work for and own a business called Love the Verb that runs and organizes the Second Saturday experience. Second Saturday is a community event in partnership with City of Peoria. They help fund this kind of, it's a grassroots organic art music monthly festival here in downtown Peoria. Our community has been really involved with growing and nurturing the arts in the West Valley and uh, primarily here in downtown Peoria. So yeah, it's a monthly event that we put on. It's free, 4 to 8 p.m. And we have a variety of bands, singer-songwriters, an art exhibit, live murals, food trucks, vendors, all that stuff. So. Axiom is uh, Axiom Church. We're here in downtown Peoria. We just celebrated 11 years as a community. We're very, uh, or Jesus-centered, relational-driven community. We're very much about just building community centered around Jesus and relationship, living that out in, in real tangible ways. We just recognize that a lot of times the growth of a community comes out of the arts. And so we really lo love the idea of having this consistent rhythm of celebration of music and art. If you want to get involved, you want to be a exhibit artist or a vendor, or you want to perform as a musician, you can go to our website, it's linktree um, slash second Saturdays. And on there, you can fill out a, a vendor or artist application. My name is Rebecca Varghese. I went to school at Grand Canyon University and I actually graduated with a theater degree. But very quickly after that, I realized that I actually really love film. I currently work as the IFP program director and I'm, 
I've developed a show for PBS that's airing uh, at 7 p.m. for the next few weeks. Uh, I've worked on a sort of a traveling documentary show about hiking in Arizona. So we go all over Arizona, all the way up to Page, all the way down almost to Mexico, um, and we hike all over the state and just um, talk to people, talk to hikers, talk to scientists, artists, anybody who are into hiking and hike with them and hear their stories and learn about the history and geology and all the science of the trails. It's, uh, it's really fun. So when it comes to your job, what made you decide to go with the Phoenix Film Festival? I had been involved with IFP Phoenix and the Phoenix Film Festival for a while, just uh, doing competitions and various things. And my job is about connection and education. I just get to help filmmakers connect with each other. I run an industry night, which is live music and food and different booths, bringing everybody together to try to connect things. Um, I do a lot of educational events, both like panels for filmmakers to talk to other filmmakers and other people who want to learn more about filmmaking and different aspects of filmmaking. Um, and then also like educational events for uh, high schoolers. And we even have a like, even younger kids day um, where kids can come and learn the very, very basics of filmmaking. Just like, here's how you draw a little tiny storyboard and this is what acting looks like and stuff like that. So from like four years old till however, till 94, there's something for everybody to learn and connect with there. And I get to kind of be a little bit of a part of that. So the Wright Gallery is a dedicated space on campus for the visual arts. I've been like associated with the school from the launch because Phil was one of the first professors to come on and I kept thinking this place needs a gallery. We decided, well, this place is just kind of a weird space as it is, right? There's lots of really nice light. It's kind of accessible to everybody and was kind of the first time like I stepped in the role where it was a little more official and we had designated this space to be the right gallery. So often we are working in this digital space when we're creating. And so it's really fun when we get students come in and they see their physical work on the wall. We cram a lot of stuff in here, but it's not huge, but we have kind of expanded. So we have a wall in the design lounge that we will put our art up in. We have the arches downstairs. Something we believe at Huntington that we're all created to create. And so it's a space that celebrates that and the creative process and in turn like our creator as well. And so we'll have like shows sometimes where it's more of a faith focus, like what's a piece that kind of represents you as an artist and your faith as well. And so then we also do have classes here that are more of traditional art and painting. And so that's a fun space to also be able to display that work. And so I like this as a space that's very collaborative and it kind of it gives a chance for each program to shine in a way that's connected. And so it's a really cool space for that to celebrate the art that's being made here and celebrate the artists as well and all their hard work. I like that about, that's one of the goals of this space is that um, it can kind of bring everybody on campus together. My name is Curtis Overby and I am the artistic director here at Arizona Broadway Theater. Arizona Broadway Theater was actually born on a napkin in New York City. So the producers and the co-founders actually lived in New York. They were trying to find something to bring to the theater community. You know, they were looking at different places around the country and they really narrowed in on Peoria because there wasn't a huge theater experience here. So they came here specifically and they built this incredible, incredible state-of-the-art theater. They just knew the things that they wanted to implement and they brought it here. And I think it's really impacted the theater community in general here in Arizona. So when I'm directing a show, my motto has always been to leave a situation better than I started. My approach as a director is to help the actor become what really pleases them. It's about coaching people to do the best and bringing out the best in them so that their best shows up on stage. 
we've really gotten this reputation nationally that people really want to come here, which only improves Peoria's reputation. And since we've been here, I've just seen the community start to talk about and get excited about theater and the access to theater. There definitely has been an expansion of desire and excitement around being a part of live theater. Okay, we're back after having watched some of those student stories that they went out and did some field assignments. Um, exciting to see them get to use their art and service in that way uh, for me. And so uh, in the next episode, uh, you'll see Mary Lou and um, Kathy Beachy, I think, is going to um, be on for Copper Hills. So it's, uh, it's exciting to see our students using uh, their craft to be of service to organizations and uh, to give platform. But I did want to talk to you about the the axiom side of yourself and uh, being a worship pastor and that relationship between using your art to kind of make a living and provide mm -hmm. as a dad, but then also facilitating meaningful worship experiences at a church. Mm -hmm. What's that like? <laughs> it's... it's really fun. I'm really, um, uh, most of the time I really enjoy my work and, and, um, getting, I mean, um, getting to, um, uh, bring like, like, kind of like I said before, bring music into spaces. Um, and I, I mean, I really do feel like, um, one of the best ways I've heard it said is, is, is open, opening up hearts. So like, that's what, that's what we're doing in, in, in a form of, you know, whether it's worship um, specific, um, but that's what music does, I think. And um, so when we're worshiping, we're opening up our hearts and, um, and we're proclaiming uh, maybe truth or, or something like that. So those are the, those are the roles and va the value I see in it is um, something special, something, yeah, special happens when, when people gather together and, and sing and actually, like, physically seeing. Um, there's science and just how there's actually something happening when rhythms of people are syncing up with each other. And, and so, yeah, there's, there's something to that that I love. Um, I love. Um, I love putting, arranging, I love arranging the liturgies and arranging, um, creating space for people to, to um, be still and that's the other side of it. So, like, it's not always, it's not even just about all the the music or the noise we get to make, but it's about also the spaces that we get to create, the space for silence and stillness and, and reflection, those kinds of things. Where do you feel most alive? <clears throat> is it, you know, when you're on stage singing, or is it facilitating a worship experience? Um, all of those things. Both of those, yeah, I would say I feel very alive. Um, just like any craft, I think it comes and goes, you know. Um, but I think most days I'm pretty filled up by by um, sharing and and hosting that space. I, it, I, we 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 like to call it setting the table um, at Axiom, or we're just we're setting the table for people to come and have a meal in a way. And the meal is... I like that you use the word hospitality. I think that's so yeah. special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a difference. Like we see it, we'll see it in Thanksgiving, right? Where it's just like you're expecting mm -hmm. people to come and mm -hmm. enjoy. Yeah. And taste and see. Yeah, exactly. You know? Cool. Okay, well, I know you're going to do a song for us. So uh, yeah, what, do you, what are you going to do? And um, what, where, did, where did, how did it come to be? Um, the song I thought about doing today is called What I Don't Know. Um, it's off of my new album I just put out. It's a, um, it's most of the record is about um, self awareness and, and just growing in that honesty with yourself. And so this song is very much in that lane, kind of um, just self reflecting. It, there's a line that's basically like, "What I don't know about myself is is out there in the open," you know. So it's like. There's just this this 
honesty that I um, felt invited to, to poke at of just that often the things about us that we most, um, that we're least aware of are probably very obvious to others. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And our spouses. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Well, take it away, brother. Keep doing it the same But wanting something different All these unconscious decisions Keep me moving but not living I just keep doing it the same Intimacy from a distance All along wondering what's missing Unaware of my condition What I don't know About myself It's probably out there in the open To everyone else What I don't know But I probably should is hidden in the outside Misunderstood Just keep doing it the same Never thought I'd see the rerun Been the same way around this mountain Trying to get a different outcome What I don't know About myself It's probably out there in the open To everyone else What I don't know But I probably should it's hidden in the shadows Misunderstood Show me what I can't see What's right in front of me Facing my grave Probably out there in the open To everyone else Well, I don't know But I probably should It's hidden in the shadows Misunderstood Yeah, it's hidden in the shadows Misunderstood <clears throat> That was so great. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. I I think what happened was supposed to happen. Um, and that song uh, was supposed to be featured in our first episode. That's mm. just special tune. So cool. help us and um, to kind of be encouraged to reflect and think deeply about how we're moving and not just floating along, man. Help yeah. us to think through what it is we're saying and doing and being to those around us. And we have an opportunity to to love others every day yeah. with how we proceed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm convicted and encouraged at the same time, which I think that's is what, what my goal is. So yeah. good. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, uh, Micah, like, thank you so much for sharing your heart and your art. And, um, we'll, we'll just definitely have you back next time if you'll have us. So, and, um, thanks well, so much for being here, helping us launch the show. Yeah. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and